The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorn was a mild-mannered graphic artist until he was bitten by the electronics bug. Now, every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to set aside fancy microcontrollers and pies for a minute and build a project using discrete logic, also called glue logic. We'll start by explaining some basic logic gates and then build a little robot with them. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today I'd like to talk to you about some of the DMD animations I have been working on for Ghost Squad. We have rollovers here on the orb targets, so you can collect those and spell orb. Then we have the pops. Pops will advance a mode. Audio and video for these games are very important, so I'm trying to do the best job that I can, so the game is fun and funny. Let's start by explaining some basic logic gates. We have the three most common ones here. A NOT gate takes an input like a 1 and inverts it, makes it a 0. An AND gate requires that this one and this one be 1, and then you'll get an output. If one of them is 0, you'll get a 0 here. An OR gate says if this one or this one is 1, we'll give you an output. There's also a gate called an XOR or exclusive OR. What it does, this can be a 1 or this can be a 1, but they both can't be 1. So this would give you an output of 1, but this would give you an output of zero. You can also use logic gates to create other logic gates. These are called universal gates. A NAND is one example. A NAND gate is an AND gate with an inverted output. So to create a NOT gate using a NAND gate, we just tie the two inputs together. So a one here, one and one, true. However, we output the inverse, which means we get a zero. Likewise, if we input a zero here, zero and zero equals no output, which is inverted into a 1, giving us a 1. So we've created a gate using a different gate. We can also create an OR gate using NAND gates. Let's say we have a 1 here and a 0 here. So 1 and 1 is 1, but inverted to 0. 0 and 0 is inverted to 1. This comes in here. This NAND gate would be untrue because the conditions aren't met, so it would be a 0 output, but it gets turned into a 1 because it's inverted and we get the correct result. Now I'm going to do a real world example of logic gates in action. The idea is to build a little robot with motors that goes around bumping into walls. And there's two switches in front, left and right, and depending on which switch gets hit by the wall, it turns left to right, turns completely around, and then goes and hits another wall. So here's the logic that's gonna make that happen. The first thing we're gonna use are two 555 timers in monostable mode. Basically, if you trigger them, they'll have a high pulse for a little bit, and then the pulse will go low. This high pulse will tell our little robot how long it should turn around for. So we have our switches here, and they have pull-up resistors, which means the default state is high or on. These timers are triggered by a low pulse, so when the switch gets hit, pulling this low, the timer will activate. The timer's default output is zero, which means the timer is not active. When the switch is hit, the timer will be active. It will equal one for about five seconds. So typically when a zero comes out from the timer, the default state, it goes to this NOT gate, and then those two NOT gates from both the left and right switches go into these two AND gates. There's another 555 timer that acts as a pulse width modulation driver, basically sending a square wave to drive the motors. So the square wave is always coming down these two channels, but these aren't necessarily always activated. So if, if no switch is hit, the robot goes forward, which means we have a zero coming out. The zeros get inverted into ones. So one here and one here means we drive the motors using a simple transistor. How the turning works is if the timer is triggered, a zero comes in here, which inverts this to a one. This gets inverted to a zero, which means zero and one, this AND gate won't trigger. So this motor won't work. Only this motor will, causing the one motor to stall, the other motor keeps turning, and the robot turns. Are these donuts slow fat? Jim, can you unsend an email? Who's the new girl? What's wrong with business casual? Is Carl joining the call? Who keeps taking my sandwich? Do you think I'd make a good stuntman? Have you guys seen Carl this week? Did we get those bonuses yet? Will this software really work? 
How do you remove a virus? Getting straight answers to all your questions at work. Where is everybody? Not as easy as it should be. Getting answers to product and technical questions from a team of engineering experts, definitely easier. Discover how we're listening to your feedback and building a better experience. Oh, Carl doesn't work here anymore. Now that I've explained logic gates, it's time to build a physical example of them being used. I'm going to dismantle the Squatch Tracker 9000, which you may remember from a previous episode. I'm going to use this motors to make a motorized carriage very much like it, that will hopefully find its way around a table and turn when it hits a perimeter. This, this tracker has found many squatches. This will be its last. We should make some better wheels. What the heck was this hooked up to? I don't even know what's going on anymore. What was this for? So in case you don't remember the Squatch Tracker episode, we used two DC motors on it, and these motors will be perfect for our new project as well. Two left and right drive motors, although this time we're gonna use pulse width modulation to vary their speed. I have all the parts cut out from the laser here, including some rubber bands for the wheels. So now I'm going to assemble the carriage. These are the feelers. What happens is when this thing bumps into something, these will get pushed and they'll hit a little switch here telling it that it's hit a wall and then it should move. At least that's the theory. Wow, this is an engineering masterpiece. Henry Ford, eat your heart out. I finally have a use for all these tack switches I've taken from Xbox controllers. I'm going to use them for the curb feelers. So when they hit something, it should push the switch. Hopefully.
So we need some AND gates, NOT gates, and 555 timers. I've got my motorized carriage put together and I've attached a breadboard to it. Now I can start doing the circuitry. These wires go to the motors and these go to the switches. The schematic we drew earlier, I've copied it down manually onto this piece of paper so I can reference it. So I'm gonna basically, I kinda of went backwards. I started with the motor drivers, which used a transistor. I went backwards to the AND gates, this PWM generator using a 555, the two NOT gates, and the two directional 555s, and of course the switches. So I'm gonna actually wire it backwards from here. So these DC motors didn't have enough torque and instead of messing around with a gearbox, I'm just going to slap on these continuous rotation servos. Servos had to be driven a little differently but that's okay because we're using 555s which can be used to drive servos. Alright so now we're using servos, I hooked up some 555s to drive servos. And as you can see, it's a lot more torque now. So that shouldn't be the problem. What I'm going to have to do now is make it so that the servos can reverse. The trick was, see how the, the motors are on mirrored, which means forward for one motor is backwards for the other motor, so I actually had to send them two different signals in order for them to move in the same direction. So now I'm going to change my logic around to make up for that. Now that I have the servos attached instead of the DC motors, I'd like to show you the other things I've done with the circuit. This is a 555 doing a square wave generation to drive the um, servos. This is an inverter right here which inverts the signals coming from the turn timers. This is the AND gate which um, looks at the 555 and the inverted signals in order to drive the servos. And then here we have two 555s which are the timers for turning left or right. Now that we have it all together, we can do a demonstration. This schematic has been updated because we're using servos now instead of our original DC motor idea. We still have a 555 for square wave generation that will drive the servos. However, since the servos are on opposite sides of the robot, we need one to move counterclockwise. We accomplish this by using a NOT gate to invert the waveform going into one of the servos. Now let's start the robot. By default, neither of the direction timers are triggered, thus they both output zeros. These zeros get inverted and become ones. These ones are anded with the square wave and thus drive both servos, making the robot go forward. When the left switch hits an obstacle, its switch goes low, which is a starting pulse for the left timer. And now that the timer is engaged, it will output a one for a short period of time. This one gets inverted to a zero and thus the and gate driving the left servo will be off. The left servo stalls while the right keeps going, causing the robot to turn. The timer duration is set with a resistor and capacitor. When the time is up, the output of the timer goes back to zero, which gets inverted to one, the AND gate reactivates, and now both motors are going again, after the robot is turned around. The same kind of cycle occurs if the right switch is hit. The result is a robot with very simple logic appearing to have a bit of intelligence. Discrete logic gate chips, like the kind we use today, have been largely replaced by microcontrollers, system on a chip, and other embedded solutions. But it's still important to know how logic gates work, since they form the basis of all electronics, and they're actually used in programming a lot too. And that's not to say they can't be used with microcontrollers. On this pinball machine, for example, we have a watchdog timer that must be continuously pulsed by the MCU, otherwise it times out and outputs a zero. In normal condition, it sends a logic one to all of these AND gates, saying that it's ready. If the AND gate gets a one from the timer and the MCU sends a one to the AND gate, one and one equals one, and then the AND gate allows the MOSFET to trigger, activating a solenoid. If the MCU crashes and the timer times out, the AND gates and the pull down resistors on them prevent the solenoids from getting stuck on. And as an added bonus, any short circuit will destroy the cheap AND gates before the expense of MCU. You may have heard of buffered inputs for things like the Raspberry Pi, that's the same idea. 
So if your project needs logic gates, don't be afraid to use them. Sometimes they're even faster than doing the logic in the code. My rave today is about hot glue. Some people think I rely on it too much. I like to think I don't use it enough. The great thing about hot glue is that it holds well, holds fast, and if used correctly with surfaces, can last a long time. Plus, roughing out a design together with hot glue is exponentially faster than trying to use screws and fasteners. Like on today's project where we had to quickly switch to servos, we just hot glued them in place. I do have a rant about hot glue though. The modern glue guns leak. You set them down and they continually see ooze glue out the end. I've had some so bad I just threw them in the trash. I found some better ones at Master Car, but they still leak a little. The older guns, say 10 to 15 years ago, didn't have this problem. So I'd suggest searching the thrift store or maybe borrow your mom's. There are probably modern high-end glue guns that don't leak, but I've yet to make that plunge. Today's viewer question comes from Mike who asks, where did you get the heater for your portable 3D printer project? Well, Mike, the heater is called a hot end, and it came from www.makergear.com, along with the geared motor that extruded it. A Google search for 3D printer hot ends will uncover many more models for you to choose from, a variety of sizes and prices. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to build our own little development board for AVR microcontrollers, just like the one you've seen me use on the show. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.